three tips if you go to some publisher's website and they promise to pay you a royalty. That is a tip off. Second tip is if they offer you a free ISBN, that's another red flag. It means they're giving you one of their ISBNs. The third thing is that these companies will often say, we will distribute your book to bookstores worldwide. Sounds great, right? It means they're uploading your book to their Ingram Spark account and your book will be in the Ingram database and bookstores worldwide and keep full control of the whole process. Welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor, and I'm passionate about helping entrepreneurs lead their ideal lives by creating better businesses. I'm a certified EOS implementer, an FBA-accredited family business advisor, and a business owner myself with several business interests. I work with established business owners and their leadership teams to help them live their ideal entrepreneurial life using EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System. My guests come onto the show to authentically share the highs and lows of operating a successful business and how they've turned things around in their business to create a better business and better life. I also invite experts on the show to share their expertise. Now, today's guest has been in the publishing business for 52 years. She got put out of her typesetting business by Steve Jobs back in the 80s, and she's an expert in what I would call true self-publishing. She helps businesses and individuals to self-publish their books, and today she's going to share what self-publishing actually is, some of the pitfalls in self-publishing, and how you can ensure that you keep control of your publishing and create a book or booklet that delivers true return on investment for you. Michelle DeFilippo is the owner of 1106 Design. Michelle, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on here. Thank you so much, Deborah. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, so we've just been speaking a little bit before the podcast and learning a bit about your history. I wonder if you would share that for me with the listeners, because you've got a very strong history in terms of publishing, haven't you? Sure. I've, I started working in the publishing industry way back in 1972 when I was 19 years old. So I've seen just about everything that's happened in publishing in, in today's world and have experienced a lot of up and downs, as, as you might have imagined. But it's, it's really good to be here on podcasts and give so many people are publishing books now that it's a great opportunity for me to share what I know and also help authors avoid some of the pitfalls that exist in today's self-publishing or independent publishing arena. Oh, that sounds good. So tell us a little bit about that sort of history. So 19 years old, so that was pretty much straight from school. What, what made you go into publishing? It was actually an accident. I wish I had told you I had a plan, but, but I didn't. I went out on a bunch of job interviews and Crown Publishing in New York City was the first one that said yes and wanted me. And so I began and, and it was, it, I loved it from the very beginning because every, every project we worked on was different and new and every author was different and new. So there was no boredom in the industry as you might expect from some other jobs. And so have you worked with anybody really famous in terms of publishing books? No, I can't say I have, although when I was living in New York and working in New York, it wasn't uncommon to walk up and down the street and see movie stars all the time. Excellent. So these days, I mean, obviously 52 years, isn't it? That's that's a long time in in, in terms of publishing and things have changed because of just technology. And we're talking about this before technology has changed the way we do a lot of things. What kind of impact do you think that's had on the publishing industry? Well, it's, it's today we have authors have more opportunity than ever in history to publish the book that they want to publish without anybody else telling them what to do or directing the process. And that is great. But back in the day, it, on, in the traditional publishing model that we're all familiar with, major publishers would take great care to produce a quality book. They would hire the experts to produce the book. And you could be assured if you went and published a book and purchased a book in a bookstore that it was a quality product. You didn't have to worry about whether or not it would be a good book. So with opportunity and with all the changes that have occurred in the publishing industry since then, it has now become possible for anybody to to produce a book. But a lot of the people who are producing books are either not aware of or are choosing to ignore the traditional publishing standards. 
So now there's risk for the buyer when they purchase a book. They really don't know until they get it in their hands or on their device whether or not it's going to be any good. So I'm here to remind people that there are still companies like mine that produce good books and can help them put out a good book that they're proud to market and sell. It is interesting because when we talked about self-publishing, I think for a lot of people, they think that that means that you're going to do everything yourself, don't they? It's like a complete DIY, but that's not really what self-publishing is, is it? No, and that's the misunderstanding that has crept into the process, that there's the technology has played a role in that. Technology now exists for you to dump your manuscript into an automated system, and something that looks kind of like a book pops out the other end. And it's free, and so a lot of people are taking advantage of that. But the problem is it's not a real book. That's not how a real good book is produced. The process is much more involved, much more technical than that. Uh, a lot of research, when it's done the right way, a lot of research goes into the cover before cover designs are, are uh, created. It's not done with a template. And even on the way the interior pages are typeset, it's, it's a craft all its own called typesetting that people are forgetting or had never even heard that word. And it's a very meticulous adjustment of all the spacing of the words and the lines and the letters on the page so that reading comprehension is enhanced and readers are not distracted by poor spacing or other oddities that, that interrupt the brain, right? So, the, so that's that's the level we work at, the traditional publisher level. And and what that means for and as an outcome is you actually have a book that is um, more likely to engage with the, the reader and present information in a more usable format, I guess. Well, yes, a good cover, first of all, makes people stop when they see it on an Amazon or even in a bookstore. And so they're if we get them to stop, that's the job of the cover. Then they can read about the book's content and decide for themselves whether or not they're interested. We can't control that. But our job is to make them stop, and we do that with a compelling cover with beautiful imagery, beautiful typography, all balanced and coordinated so that it looks like a book from a major publisher. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, so self-publishing, so what it really is, is it, it, yes, you get to write the content, but you're still engaging with an expert who can ensure that content is produced in a way that people actually want to to read it. Ideally, yes. And it's surprising to any of us who have been in the industry for a long time. How how can writers who theoretically love books, and that's why they're publishing one themselves, how can they not see the difference between a book that's been formatted in Microsoft Word or a cover that's been designed with a template a certain kind of blindness creeps in. I, I can't quite put my finger on it. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me because everybody knows what a good book looks like. And that author's customers also know what a good book looks like. So if if the intent is to save money, you know, I hear that a lot. I can't afford to do it except to do it myself. You're really kind of cutting off your chances to succeed before you even begin. Mm, yeah, you kind of have to bite your face. Okay, so... Why, why do people r decide to write books? I mean, I know there's a lot of people writing books out there, but what are the main reasons you might sort of think about writing a book? Oh, gosh, all kinds of reasons. Sometimes it's someone who is getting on in years and they want to write down the events of their life and describe their life and share their thoughts with, with the people, their children and grandchildren and so forth, so that they have something to hold in their hands after, after grandma or grandpa passes, Right. That's one reason. Other people are, are writing memoirs. They, they've had an interesting life and they, they also want to write it down to maybe inspire people or help other people get through a difficult situation or, or help them in some other way, right? Business people write books to establish a brand and to tell people about their company and what they've accomplished and where they are in their business life. And then finally, and I've done this myself, some small businesses can write a booklet. It doesn't have to be a full-length book, but write a booklet, give it away on their website, and tell people about their business so that they can learn about you in a non-threatening way before they're ready to engage with a salesperson. So that works really well, too, to bring in new business leads. 
Perfect. So it's like a white paper on steroids, I guess. Yes, except it looks better. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so let's focus a little bit on the business area because obviously that's my area of specialty. So I think often people, yes, yeah, so they want to write a book to either share their experiences or to share their expertise with the ultimate intention, I suppose, of creating some credibility and some expertise, but also potentially getting new clients. What are the biggest mistakes people make when they write books for a business purpose? Oh, gosh, I, I probably making a book that's too long, right? Sometimes, you know, because if you look, authors should start, before they even begin writing, first of all, they should know who they're writing for. What problem are they solving? You know, try to find a burning problem in the world and offer your take on what the solution is, and you'll have a better chance of selling that book to people who need your advice. The next bit of advice would be don't make your book too long. If you notice what major publishers are doing, books are much shorter than they were even 20 years ago, right? People, the internet has trained us to want information in small chunks. Nobody has the patience to read a 400 or 500 page book anymore. So those, those are the two things we usually see. The other mistake I see a lot is that someone who is very competent in their career, what, you know, whether it, it's an attorney or a PhD or something like that, they think they don't need editing and they do. Everyone needs an editor. Even the Pope has an editor. So you, you really do need to have unbiased eyes on your manuscript before it's published so that someone other than yourself can see what you didn't notice. I think it's true, isn't it? Because we, we tend to, I, I do this all the time in business, is because I'm an expert in a number of things, I kind of assume that everybody else has that same expertise and you realize that they don't. And so we explain it in a way that makes perfect sense to ourselves, but it does not mean that it actually makes sense to somebody who doesn't have the same knowledge, skills, background, experience, qualifications that we do. So, so the editor's role is to actually look at it from an outsider's perspective and go, does this actually make sense? Does it speak to me? I mean, what, tell me what the role of the editor is. What do they really do for that book? Well, they, they do quite a lot, but, but mostly they're a stand-in for your eventual reader, right? So if they read a paragraph and it doesn't click for them or they don't understand what you're saying, and they don't have to be an, uh, an expert in your subject matter, but the writing has to be clear. And so they would be more likely, like you just said, when we talk about our own area of specialty, we know what we mean to say, and so it, it seems perfect. But if you're trying to reach people who are not experts in your area, you have to explain yourself a little differently. And that's what editors do, in, in addition to correcting grammar and, and syntax and, and, you know, redundancy and all of that kind of thing. I'm sitting here thinking, I'm thinking, you know, with the invent of AI and chat GPT and all these various different tools out there, probably a lot of people are thinking, oh, but I can just run it through chat GPT and that will kind of um, do the same job. <laughs> I know that's not the right answer, but I just wanted to get your kind of your your feeling on that and how you would respond to that. Well, yeah, I think we've all seen AI writing it and it makes mistakes, doesn't it? And you have to know how to spot, you know, you know, I, I remember. I, I think it makes more than mistakes. I think it also, I mean, it tends to have, you know, you, I can always tell when something has been written by AI because it has this um sort of language and it's not even language that I think we we use naturally as humans so it it feels like it's been written by AI but yeah yeah tell me more what what is the diff what sort of things do you see the editor really adding value as opposed to just going through an AI bot oh well an editor is a human being that's <laughs> that's number one so they know how text can be made better that's their specialty yep. Right. So they're going to smooth out the bumps that are in your manuscripts that, that you didn't see. I'll date myself here and I'll tell you when I was when I was young is when calculators first came out. Right. Oh, yes. And so, of course, at that time, a lot of people were against them. No, no, no. You have to do the math by, you know, manually. Right. Or with an abacus. I remember this. I've also got an abacus in our house. Yep. But but the tr but even with a calculator, we now I mean you, it, there's a parallel there, right? Because you do a calculation and you've done something wrong, you recognize when it's wrong because you know math. So that's what the that's what the editor does. You've said something, whatever it is, and the editor will recognize where you're trying to go with it, and and smooth it out for you. Okay, so let's just say that I decided that I wanted to write a book. 
where on earth would you start? I think you already mentioned this at the beginning. You ought to know who, you know, what pain point you're solving and who you're going after. But yeah, let's go right the way back to basics. So I go, hey, look, I've been around for 53 years. I've got all this experience that I want to share. I want to share some of the um, challenges I've been through and how I've overcome them. But I have no idea where to start. Where would I even think about starting? Well, the hardest part is starting, right? Once you make the commitment to start, then you can find your own method of how to proceed, right? Some people like to make detailed outlines and, and sketch out the plot and everything if they're writing a novel, but other people just like to go at it and see where where the impulse takes them. So that's an individual choice, and that's also why an editor is necessary, because maybe you thought it flowed well from point A to point B, but it, but perhaps it didn't if you were winging it. So, yeah, you, you need the professionals, the people who specialize in words to help you out. So if you're working with a, a potential author, what do you, what do you, do they come to you once they've completely finished what they're thinking of, or do they come to you beforehand? What's the best way? Most, most of them come to us when they have a completed manuscript. I, I occasionally get a call for someone who's looking for writing help, and I tell them we don't do that, but, but I can recommend to them writing coaches or ghost writers, depending on what it is they need, what stage they're at. So we can take a finished manuscript, and the first thing we do is an editorial evaluation so that the editor can, usually within the first 75 pages or so, tell if the author, what level of skill the author has in, in writing the text, and that lets the editor see how much time may be needed to get the text into shape. And we'll send that evaluation to the editor. Sometimes the, the author can correct a whole bunch of things that the editor pointed out and come back with a much cleaner, much tighter manuscript. And then we'll go into the copy editing stage for them. Okay. I'm really keen to hear a bit more about, about the, the booklets that you described. So that's a little bit different to writing a book, right? Because a book, yeah, is it, it could be a could be fiction, could be nonfiction, and you've obviously got a, a sense of what you want to do. It's really interesting. A couple of my friends have actually got into writing um, nonfiction books, and they, and they they really you know come from a business background, but just really wanted to get into writing, and now write the most amazing books and do really well with them. But for a lot of us, we're more business focused, and we're going okay. I think it'd be really helpful to have a a little mini booklet that would help the business. But where would you start with that? Is it something that you can take content that already exists and then develop something, or what is the best way to look at that? I can say with confidence that any business owner already has their booklet in their head. It's, it's the questions you answer all the time. It's the, the things that uh, people ask you all the time. And all you need to do is get started and just start typing it in, putting it in rough form, and then we could take it from there. My little book is called Publish Like the Pros, and I offer this for free on my website in PDF form. And it just takes people through the, the stages of the self-publishing process and offers advice and then gets a little technical into the details of how authors are paid and, and which is the best way to set up their publishing enterprise so that they make the most money. Okay, you've just um, raised a really interesting point for me now. Of course, there is, if you think about it, we've, we've pretty much all got ebook capability these days. So I'm a big fan. I've got a Kindle. I've also got a Kobo. I've always got one of them with me. But I also really like physical books as well. So I've got an entire library of physical books. And, and I think there's pros and cons to both. I really sometimes, you know, if a book is a how-to book, I enjoy writing in the book, which I know is, is sacrilege, but it's like it's actually good to have that and little tabs and things. Whereas when you're reading on a, on a Kindle or a Kobo, it's a little bit different. What is the main difference between a, a, an e-book versus or, or, you know, a Kindle book versus a printed book? Do you still go through the same type of typesetting and looking at how it's presented? What's the main differences? Well, people, but when ebooks ebooks have been through at least three generations now, and every time they always predict the death of print books, and it never happens. People still love a real book. There's just, well, first of all, for when you when we're producing a print book, we we can do far more aesthetically with the text and the cover and the typesetting than you can do in an ebook. An ebook, by definition, looks generic because it has to be able to reflow on any device. So you can't do nice design on an ebook. It has to be just kind of bland. And I think that's why a lot of people don't like ebooks because they all look the same. Whereas a print book, you can open it and you can say, oh, that looks nice. Or gee, I, I wouldn't have thought of doing that. And 
it's it's more of an experience, I think, than an ebook. Okay, and so I'm just looking behind me. You can see I've got some of my favorite books there, and I've got a whole library downstairs in my session room because I really do enjoy having the hard copies of books. So there's nothing to stop. So, but once you've got a really good printed book, it's then easy to translate it into an ebook. Is that is that fair to say? Yes, we we lay out our books in Adobe InDesign, and then we can export export that file to ebook format, but it takes a lot of manipulation even after that, because there's two kinds of ebooks creation. You'll hear about ebook conversion and you'll hear about ebook formatting. Now, ebook conversion is generally done by a machine. So a machine makes the decisions about how things should be coded. Ebook formatting is done by a human being who knows how that text is going to display on different devices and will enter codes accordingly that say something like, if this is opened on a Kindle, Kindle, do this. If this is opened on a Nook, do this instead. And the result is a better experience for the reader, no matter what device the ebook is opened on. Okay. I didn't realize that. So there's two different ways of doing it. Fabulous. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little about about covers now because it is interesting. So you you go into a bookstore and there are definitely certain books that grab your attention and make you want to pick them up. What is it that in general terms makes a book cover attractive? Well, two things, imagery, right? The photogra- If you use photography or you buy an image of something else, an, il- an illustration perhaps, it has to be done well, executed well. And then the next most important thing is the typography. You can, I guarantee you can look at a book cover in the bookstore and it's just plain words on a cover sometimes, I can tell you that the designer went through 25 or 30 renditions of that to get it just so. It wasn't done, it wasn't done in two minutes by, pick, by picking a font and, and you know, it, a lot of work goes into it. But, but the result, it's kind of like, I guess, I guess a parallel would be a man's suit or even a woman's suit. You know a good suit when you see it even if you're not a tailor. And so that craftsmanship also applies to a book cover. If you, if you're, if, if people are out looking for a designer on the internet, what they should always do is compare that designer's work to the books being put out currently by major publishers, just to make sure that that designer is working at the level of the major publisher. Because if you just look at the designer's work alone, you might say, oh, those covers are nice. I like them. But we don't want you to like them necessarily, although that's a plus. We want the buyer to like them. <laughs> and so that takes a lot of research to to get it just right, to see what they are buying. And as you said, I mean, there's so many different types of design and they're all very, very different, right? So you've got obviously people who design for websites are completely different people who design book covers are completely different people who design adverts. And so just because they're a designer doesn't mean that they're necessarily a book designer. Is that fair to That's say? That's a critical point, yes. Yeah. 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 And I think, I mean, I know that in, in today's world, it's so easy to jump onto Fiverr or any of those sort of places and get very kind of cheap designers. But at the end of the day, I, I always, I mean, I'm from a sales and marketing background. I'm a particularly strong on brand. And so I'm always very pedantic about the fonts that we use. And I, 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 I you know, often have specific fonts as opposed to generic fonts that are available. And so as a consequence, I'm, I'm very fussy about the way things are put. Sometimes people, if you don't understand design, you could look at a ve- you know something that somebody's done on a design and kind of think, oh, yeah, that looks pretty, but it doesn't mean it's effective. The prettiness does not equal effectiveness, is what I guess I'm trying to say. That's correct. And color does not substitute for good design. A good design will hold up in black and white as well as in color. Of course. Yeah, because it's going to have to be black and white on, on many of the reading devices as well, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Okay, what else would you like to share with the readers? Like, What else could you give them in terms of tips or tools if they're thinking about wanting to write, whether it be, as as you said, for a memoir, for a business, for a a, a mini book, what are the three kind of key things that you see they should be thinking of? Well, if I may, I would love to talk a little bit about what happens after the manuscript is done. It's, it's It's a very natural thing for an author to say to themselves, my manuscript's done, I need to go find a publisher. Well, you don't actually need to find a publisher anymore because Amazon changed all that. There are self-publishing companies and hybrid publishers and, and now companies that are calling themselves publishers. 
But what they do is they charge the author to produce the book. Then they publish it in their name. And when a book is sold, they get the revenue, they get the sales reports, and then they give the author some of the money if they're a good company. If they're a bad company, the author may never see a dime and the company may disappear overnight. That's happened quite a bit. So so how can an author know that there, then there are companies like mine that just sell author services. We help you produce the book and then we do not, we are not your publisher. You can set up print on demand accounts in your own name so that when books are sold, you get the sales reports, you get the money in your bank account and nobody else is sharing your revenue. So that's our key point. So how on earth can an author who's maybe doing this for the first time identify the good guys from the bad guys? And I can give you three tips about that. The first tip is if you go to some, some publisher's website and they promise to pay you a royalty, that is a tip off. That means that they're publishing the book under their name, they're getting the money first, and they're paying you less than the full compensation that that book has earned, okay? The second tip is if they offer you a free ISBN, that's another red flag. It means they're giving you one of their ISBNs, which means that they are registered as the publisher of your book, not you. And they control your book. And even though they charged you to produce book files, they control those files and you will never be able to get them back if you want to part ways with them for any reason. We get calls about this every week. Right. The, th the third thing is that these companies will often say, we will distribute your book to bookstores worldwide. Sounds great, right? It does not mean your book is going to be on the shelf of bookstores worldwide. It means they're uploading your book to their Ingram Spark account and, and your book will be in the Ingram database and bookstores worldwide can order it if they wish, right? You can open up an Ingram Spark account in your own name and keep full control of the whole process. So those three things are, are the main red flags that you should look at. Actually, it's really interesting because you're right. I think that what people don't understand is that if you do go through one of these type publishers and they do take your manuscript, it is theirs forever, right? You can never take it back, which means you have very little control over what you do in the future. Is that correct? Yes, they'll, they'll send you a PDF, but a PDF can't be altered. If you want to change your book and publish it in a different way with a different, either under your own name or even take it to a different publisher, I don't know why you would, but a PDF can't be, can't be edited. And so what, what you would need to get is called the application files or the native files, and they will never release them. Okay, interesting. I want to just go explore a little bit about print on demand, because obviously this is something that's only really come... It's only really become truly available in the last few years. I mean, it's been around for a long, long time, but it was very, very expensive. And that, so print on demand, if my understanding of it, and I'd love you to correct me if, if I'm wrong, is that you upload all of the files into Amazon. And then if somebody orders it, it's not, at, you don't hold a whole bunch of books sitting around and they send one out. They literally produce it as it's ordered and it gets sent out to that person on demand. Is that right? But that's correct. And it's the best thing that's happened to book publishing since ever. When I first started in this business, if you wanted to print a book, you had to print 5,000 copies. And of course, as soon as those 5,000 copies were delivered, you immediately found the typo that you missed, right? Now, now with print on demand, the book is not printed until it's ordered and paid for by the customer. It's printed, shipped to the buyer. You don't have to lift a finger. You don't have to put money into inventory. You don't have to store books in your garage or closet and hope to sell them. So it takes away that whole level of expense that used to exist. Hmm. That's right. It was, a, it was a huge investment, wasn't it? You had to buy 5,000 books. And like you said, I've, I've got friends who've literally got books sitting in their garage still from when they did their first print run. Yeah. Early on, I had a customer who would print, the, a printer talked him into printing 10,000 books because the the unit cost would be lower, which is true. But, you know, the real unit cost is how many books do you sell, right? If you print 10,000 and you sell 100, now what's the unit cost? Right? So, yeah, PO print on demand is terrific. And so it's only for softback books, though, isn't it? They can't print a 
Well, can you bring to Hob back as well? No, we we actually, for our customers, we set them up at kdp.com, which is owned by Amazon. And we also set them up at ingramspark.com, which feeds all of the other book retailers, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, whoever, libraries, physical bookstores, and so forth. So by using both of those platforms together, the customer can get the widest distribution at the lowest cost. Ingram Spark prints beautiful hardcover books, and you have lots of choices in terms of paper and whether or not you have a jacket and what, what's printed on the case underneath the jacket. It's, it's beautiful. So when we have a customer who wants a hardcover and a soft cover, we set up the hardcover and the soft cover at Ingram Spark so that they feed their channels those formats, and we let Ingram Spark feed Amazon the hardcover. Wow. Okay, so that's really good because I remember that in the early days it was definitely only softbacks. So that's brilliant. So you can pretty much have, because I actually, there are certain books you really want to have in a hardback cover because you know you're going to keep them for a long time and you want to keep, you know, referring back to them. So it's nice that there's actually that option to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, we, um, and I actually advise my customers if they want to consider it to publish a hardcover, a softcover, and an ebook. Because when the buyer comes to your retailer's page, your Amazon page, your Barnes & Noble page, and they see three formats, they automatically get the sense that you're a serious publisher. You're not a self-publisher who's only offering a, an ebook because that was the cheapest way to go. They have more confidence in you because you've done the work and you're showing them you've done the work. Perfect. Okay. Well, this is really exciting. So things have really taken leaps and bounds forward in terms of what can be done as a self-publisher. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I'm, I'm not, I don't want you to get specific here, but in terms of investment, you know, in terms of timeframes, in terms of the cost to kind of get this. So I've written a, a, a brilliant manuscript, in my opinion. I bring it to you and, and obviously you're just going to have a look at it and they're going to say, oh, yes, we're going to change a few things here. What is the kind of the time frame generally from, and let's just talk about a full book. So a full business book from, you know, idea and here's my manuscript through to being ready to be bought on print on demand on Amazon or through any bookstore? Well, our average completion time from, from getting the manuscript to uploading the files to the platforms is generally three to four months. But the turnaround time actually depends more on the author than on us. We need a couple of weeks for each service, editing, cover design, interior layout, proofreading, and so forth. But if the, if the author doesn't respond timely, or if they make a lot of rounds of revisions, then of course the completion date is extended extended beyond that. Great. Okay. So, it, it and I think this is what I'm kind of learning as well as it, it, you can't just go. I've got this book idea. It'll be out there in a couple of weeks. There is obviously some investment to make sure you do the best you possibly can. And just like any other piece of um, work that you would do, it's about return on investment. So spend the time upfront doing things properly means you'll get a better result in the long run. Well, I will tell you, we don't force people into packages. They can come to us and, and, and order a package of services a la carte based on what they want. Sometimes people come to us with their manuscript already having been edited, and that's fine. We'll start with the cover design, right? And we don't, we don't use templates to design. We do it the old-fashioned way, real collaborative design with the author having input at every stage of the process. And then from a a return on investment. So if you think about when you actually publish a book, I mean, if you buy a, a book these days, I guess you're spending something like $30 for a book. What, how much generally gets to the author from that amount? Well, that, that's a really good question. I have, I have some numbers here based on a $20 book, okay? Well, the retailer typically, Amazon takes 40% and Ingram Spark takes 55% of the cover price. But when you, when, you, when you publish on your own, when you control your own publishing business, you can set the retail price. So, of course, you should keep it competitive, but you set the retail price. The, the retailer takes 40 or 55%. The print cost might be 4 or $5, so that's also deducted. And then if you self-publish the way we recommend, the net $8 would go to your bank account. If you're working with a hybrid publisher or a self-publishing company, you might get $2. So the publisher is actually spent making more money on your book than you are. Yeah. But I suppose the, 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 the final question from me is it's like it's all very well having a book, but books don't necessarily walk off the shelves themselves. You've still got to do a lot of work to actually get your book out there. So how do people, what do you have to do to get your book out there and to get people wanting to, to buy it? 
Well, like I said before, first you should write a book that somebody that you know that a lot of people want, and that that uh, that authors sometimes miss the boat. There, they write the book that they want to write without having checked whether anybody else would agree. <laughs> so, you know, you can't just write the book you're interested in if you want to sell books. You can do it if you want. If you don't care whether you sell books or not, then you can do whatever you want. But if you want to sell books, you should try to find your audience first and write to the audience and to the problem that they are facing. You know, then after that, you do have to market the book. And that is, it's difficult. It's time consuming. We have some resources that authors who want to roll up their sleeves and do it themselves can take advantage of and save money. Or they can, and I will also introduce them to three book marketing professionals that I trust with my life. They will interview the author and see if it's a good fit. And if it is, they will, you know, they, then the author can choose to work with them on their own, separate from our services. Okay. So I, mean, I think it's, you've got to be realistic. It's not, it's not easy to have a best-selling book because it has to be something that people want. It has to, yeah, you've got to sell quite a lot of books actually to make money. Even if you're talking about having $8 in your pocket, that's still got to do the maths on that. If you want to become a millionaire, it's not going to happen by selling your first round of a thousand books, right? <laughs> sure. Well, one of one of the early gurus in self-publishing who's passed away now, Dan Pointer, he used to joke that a bookstore is a lousy place to sell books. And it's true because you're giving them 40 to 55% of your, of your cover price right off the bat. So it's also good if you can develop private channels to sell your book directly to the customers yourself. Now, Ingram Spark has a great new feature called shareable purchase links. You can go to ingramspark.com and type that in and get the details. Basically, you can generate a link that you put on your website and the customer will click that link. They will purchase the book. Ingram Spark will assess a 350 handling fee and they'll charge the printing. And then the customer will pay for shipping and handling, but you still wind up in a way better position than if you sold that same book through a retailer. So that's something to look into too. Okay, nice. And you can take you can you can take that link and put it on your Facebook page and say, "Here, my book is available," and not go through a retailer at all. Perfect. Okay, that's great. Hey, look, you give some really really good tips there. Thank you so much for that. We're going to put a link in the podcast so if you want to find out more about Michelle and her company, what she can do for you. You'll find that link there in the in the podcast. Any kind of final thoughts that you'd like to share with the audience, Michelle? I would just say, please, please, please do everything you can to release a quality book. Making a book is an art form. It's important. It's not a commodity. It's not something to just be dashed together and hope you're going to get good results. You know, be like publishers of old. Put put your heart. You put your heart and soul into the writing. Now put your heart and soul into the packaging and the typesetting and the cover so that the final product reflects all of the hard work and care you put into the writing. Flit. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Hey, look, thank you so, so much. Thank you for coming on the show. Um, thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise. And I look forward to chatting again soon. Thank you for having me, Deborah.